Please open up with me to Matthew chapter 13. Please, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. We won't be reading there just yet, but turn to that general vicinity and we will look at a few selected verses there shortly. Last time we were together, we finished up in the book of Titus, our series in the book of Titus. And after much prayer and consideration on what to preach on next, I decided upon a new series looking at the parables of Jesus. And so we'll begin there this morning in our series on the parables of Jesus. As I was doing my pre-studies and and language research for this series, I began to look in depth at what a parable actually is and what a parable is not. And to my surprise, there was incredible confusion and mystical perception as to what parables actually are. Seems to be so much division about what par- what the intended purposes of the parables were when Jesus spoke them some 2,000 years ago. And so I thought in beginning this series, it was only appropriate and fitting that we clear up any misunderstanding and any misperceptions when it comes to the parables. So this morning we'll walk through several different passages with the intent of discovering the true purposes of the parables of Jesus Christ. We'll look at the, the critical role that they played in the rejection of Jesus right up until the final week of his life. And we'll look at how we are to understand the parables when we go through a few of them later on. But firstly, what exactly is a parable? Many of us have a favorite parable that, that comes to mind when, when we think about parables, whether it be the parable of the prodigal son, parable of the sower, parable of the wheat and the tares, or parable of the Samaritan. Many affectionate stories come to mind when we think about the parables. In total, there are about 40 of them recorded in Scripture, and they are only found in what we call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are no parables found in the Gospel of John. Now, Jesus' parables are essentially ingeniously simple word pictures with a profound spiritual lesson. A parable is a word picture that demonstrates truth. The word itself, para, where we get parallel from, means to lay alongside. And so a parable is a story that is laid alongside truth to demonstrate the parallel reality. A parable is not merely a a short or simple analogy, but rather an elongated simile or metaphor with a distinctly spiritual lesson. As one writer puts it, a parable is more than a a short figure of speech like strong as an ox or, or blind as a bat. Those are simple to understand and require no further explanation. A parable, however, extends the comparison into a longer story or more complex metaphor with the meaning, always a spiritual truth, not necessarily obvious, end quote. Now, Jesus hadn't always spoken in parables. It's something that is very important to note when we look at his ministry as a whole. Teaching in parables was a complete change in his ministry style. Look at me at Matthew 13, verse 1. It says, On that day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. It's amazing when we read Verses like this, they seem relatively simple and and insignificant. There was a day when Jesus went out of the house and he sat down by the sea. What's, What's the big deal? But this verse in particular here marks the complete change, the biggest change in Jesus' entirely entire earthly ministry. It is anything but an insignificant verse. When we look at the the life of Christ as a whole, he was on this earth for about 33 years. And of that time, he was only ministering for about three years. It began with with John baptizing him in in the River Jordan and ultimately ended at the cross and then the resurrection. In terms of, of ministry length, the time was quite short. But the Lord had achieved all he needed to do in those three years. That's something we often forget about the life of Christ. Three years does not take much time to go by. 
Yet, his teachings had a profound change on all of history. And even more so, a profound change in our lives for all of eternity. But on that day in verse 1, then down to verse 3, he began speaking to them in parables. This day actually began back in, in chapter 12, as we will read. It is a Sabbath day, and this is towards the end of the second year of Christ's ministry, almost one year prior to his death at Calvary. And up until this point in time, Jesus' teaching had mainly comprised of sermons with, with brief illustrations. It was simple teaching of doctrine or simple teaching of theology, simple exposition of the Old Testament and straightforward discourse. We can think of the entire Sermon on the Mount. That was a great theological discourse with some illustration. There is no examples of parables thus far in his teaching. From this point onwards, however, never again does Jesus speak plainly to the, in his public ministry. He never speaks plainly to the people. And so we must ask the question, why? Why the change? Why the need to go from sermonic teaching to metaphoric parables where the meaning is often clouded? Why? What would have caused Jesus to change his entire ministry style from now right up until his death in one year time? To answer that, we need to look back at the start of chapter 12, where this day began. Look with me there for a moment. We'll read verse 1 of chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck off heads of grain and eat them. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Behold, your disciples are doing what is not permitted to do on the Sabbath. So it was the Sabbath day. Jesus and his disciples were walking through this field together and they were starting to get a bit peckish. And so they picked off some grain and, and decided to enjoy a light snack. But this action, as we read of in verse 3, the plucking of grain and even the walking was strongly forbidden. And it was enforced by the Pharisees, the religious elite of the Jews. They equated this plucking of grain to be like full-blown combine harvesting, basically. It was considered as being work and therefore was not permitted on the Sabbath day of rest. You might think, like I did, well, what's the big deal? They were plucking some grain and, and eating it. You know, that's, uh, that doesn't really make any difference. But, but to the Pharisees, they absolutely hated this. They detested it. It grated against every single chord of their belief system. Any idea of, of work or, or things relating to work were considered a violation of God's law and therefore required punishment, either by excommunication or worse still, punishment, or the punishment of death by stoning. This was one of their works-based ideas that, at least in their eyes, made them holy and righteous before Yahweh. This whole over-the-top enforcement of the Sabbath goes all the way back to when the law of God was given to God's people. Remember the Ten Commandments, one of which was to keep the Sabbath day holy. And pretty much straight away after the law was given, the Israelites began disobeying it. They were not using it as a day of worship. They were not using it as a day of rest. And they were not using it to delight in the things of God. And in the end, the, the rabbis, they were becoming concerned about these violations of the Sabbath. And so they, they wanted to protect it. And so they started uh, so clearly telling the people that it was a day to worship God and, and to rest. That wasn't sinking in. And so the people were just doing basically whatever they wanted to do. And the Pharisees then created this massive complex of Sabbath laws and practices that were absolutely ridiculous, as was the one that we read here this morning. Jesus and his disciples were, they were just walking for a start, and that was forbidden. But then to pluck grain because they were hungry, it seems that the need for food does not compare when it comes to keeping the Sabbath holy in the mind of the Pharisees. Their, their laws might have fitted perfectly with their legalistic system of religious works, 
but they were completely burdensome and oppressive to the people, above and beyond what the Sabbath day of rest was intended for. The Sabbath, as we all know, is the day of rest and supposed to be anything but a burden to the people. It was supposed to be a delight, according to Isaiah 58. The Sabbath was a gracious weekly reminder that humanity has a standing summons to practice the Lord's rest. Scripture introduces this theme of of the Sabbath right at the beginning with the climax of the entire creation story. No need to turn there with me, but Genesis 2.1 says, And the heavens and the earth and all their array were finished. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. And God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because on it he rested from all his work of creating that there was there to do. When God had finished his creation, he rested. Not because he needed relief or recovery, but because his work was finished. He declared the Sabbath holy as a favor to humanity. Work is tiresome for us. And that is a result of the the curse that humanity's sin has brought upon all creation. Ecclesiastes 4.8 says, A man left to himself will discover that there is no end to his labors. The Sabbath is a celebration of the Lord's finished work, ultimately culminating in the cross and the work of Christ at Calvary. The Sabbath is supposed to be a weekly reminder of the grace of God. And that, all, that always stands in stark contrast to our own human work and human endeavors. The Sabbath is God's way of showing His mercy by allowing the constant chain of work to be broken. But during the time of Christ, the people had forgotten this. They are instead following these legalistic practices out of the fear of excommunication or even death. And then Christ comes along and begins to break all these rules. He seems to throw a spanner in their works-based idea of salvation, constantly acting upon opportunities to show the Pharisees how wrong their rules were. And in chapter 12, we see this. They are walking on the Sabbath. They're plucking grain on on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are going absolutely nuts. But Jesus... There in chapter 12, he he gives them the example of David, one of their their heroes, eating the bread of presentation out of the temple just to show them how ridiculous their rules and ideas are. And then really, I love this, just to drive home his point to the max, he says in verse 8 of chapter 12, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Essentially, he's saying, I will decide what to do on the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath. This was just about the worst thing the Pharisees could have heard. The Sabbath was their their little pet hobby horse, if you like, and, and they took pride in keeping it above all else. And for someone to say that I am the Lord of the Sabbath, that grated them like nothing else could. In chapter 12, Jesus goes on to heal a man with a withered hand. Verse 11 What man will be there among you who will have one sheep? And if this one fell into the pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Then to what degree is a man worth more than a sheep? So then, it is permitted to do good on the Sabbath. Again and again, Jesus makes a point on this day of showing the Pharisees the foolishness of their legalistic ways. But yet, this day is is not over. Jesus is still not finished on this day. Verse 22, verse 22 he heals a, a demon-possessed man. When the people saw him do that, they started saying, perhaps this one is the son of David. And so the people here were starting to follow Jesus. They were perhaps starting to see that he was the promised Messiah. And the Pharisees by now are, are well and truly angry. In verse 24, they said, This man does not expel demons except by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. 
I mean, this is, this is two years into Jesus' ministry, and after seeing all the miracles and all the healings that he'd done and all the work that he had done in his ministry so far, the Pharisees came to the conclusion that he was doing everything through the power of Satan. They were fools. They were complete fools. And if their conclusion is that, after two years of ministry, then there was no hope for them. And that's why we see explained through the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in the following verses. On the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, one commentator writes, quote, When you blaspheme the Holy Spirit by saying that which he has done through the Son of God is from hell, you are beyond the point of salvation. You can speak a word against the Son of Man. You can speak a word against his humanness. You can speak a word against his life. All that can be forgiven. But if your conclusion is that what the Holy Spirit has done through him is from hell, you will not be forgiven. The Pharisees were were foolish. They were blind. And they were full of anger. Verse 14, now they went out and plotted against him in order that they could destroy him. All that on this day. Verse 1 of chapter 13. So now Jesus begins to speak in parables. Why? Why does he change? Why does he now give illustrative stories? Well, this seems to be where many people differ in their understanding of the parables. And this is why I spent the time explaining the context leading up to this change in teaching style. Any Misunderstanding here will cause you to go down a path that is dangerously misleading and has the potential for great damage to any ministry, further blinding the hearers. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that misunderstanding the parable's intent has the potential to, be- to fool you into believing that you are a believer when in fact the opposite is true. Many people after 32 years, many people believe that after 32 years of, of Jesus' life and, and two years of ministry, Jesus finally realized that his teaching style just wasn't sinking in. And therefore, he needed to change it so that people could better understand. Jesus finally realized, you know what? Sermonic exhortation and, and doctrinal teaching, it's not really working with these guys. I better dumb things down so that everybody can understand. Those who believe this would go so far as to say that we should do the same today in our teaching and our preaching. Exegetical, expositional sermons based on the scriptures just don't seem to cut it anymore. We must be storytellers in the pulpit. I take the verse in, in Mark 4, 34, that Jesus didn't speak to them without parables to mean that we should be doing the same. But what this makes allowances for is the watering down of theology, the watering down of doctrine, and the watering down of the Word of God. All to make it more palatable to the hearer. You don't think this is, this is happening? Visit any other church that does not hold strongly to the Word of God. Visit the local megachurch. This is the justification that they give for these wish-washy, feel-good love stories they try to pass off as weekly sermons. I heard one sermon recently. This is basically the summary of it, except the the guy spoke it like a four-year-old. He said, My mum went to the shops when I was a kid, and I thought she was never coming back, and so I cried, but then she came back because she loved me, Jesus loves me, parable of the lost sheep, Matthew 18. That kind of watered-down rubbish is what is making inroads in the church today. Pulpits are being removed and replaced by screens and drama teams, all to increase the emotional attachment of these stories. This is so dangerous as it has the flavors of Christianity but no real substance. People get vague ideas about who Jesus really is and maybe if they're lucky they they get a mention of what he's done. He's gone to the cross but that's all. It seems to be one big love story. Jesus loves me and has a plan for my life. That is all. That stuff is making inroads into our church today like nothing else. And it is sad that people are being fooled and blinded by it. 
Another danger and misunderstanding that people have when they come to the parables is multiple interpretations. These people say that there is no true way of of knowing what Jesus meant when he spoke in parables, and therefore it is up to the hearer to determine what he is saying. Basically, whatever it means to you, it means to you, and whatever it means to me, it means to me. There is absolutely no definitive truth. And again, this is incredibly dangerous thinking, because if you apply that here, then you have free range to apply that elsewhere. And in doing so, you get rid of objective truth of the Scriptures. A simple misunderstanding of what the parables are can lead to a slippery slope of incorrect biblical teaching and incorrect biblical interpretation. That is why we need to understand the context of this day. Jesus didn't speak in in parables to make his teaching more palatable. Rather, he spoke in parables primarily as a judgment on unbelief. The parables are a judgment on unbelief. Look at me at Matthew 13, verse 10. The disciples came and, and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? That is the question. Why are you doing this, Lord? Jesus answered, verse 11, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. Jesus now speaks in parables so they cannot understand. It was a judgment on willful, hard-hearted unbelief. For whoever, to hear, for whoever has to him, more shall be given, and he will have in abundance. That's the disciples. But whoever does not have, even what, he shall be, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. This is a judgment. This is Jesus' judgment on unbelief. If somebody says that we need to speak in in parables or stories to to make things clearer to unbelievers, that is the opposite to what Jesus intended when he gave the parables back 2,000 years ago. They were designed to hide the truth from unbelievers, not reveal it more. They have a primary, primary role of judgment for unbelievers. Those who spurn God's offer of salvation. They are not meant to be clear. They are meant to hide the truth in riddles. Jesus changed his preaching style to parables as a a way of judging those who rejected his clear teachings, those like the Pharisees were. As well as being a judgment, the, the parables also have this beautiful element of mercy. If Jesus kept speaking to the, cloud, to the crowds in, in clear, unmistakable terms and kept explaining Scripture and kept proclaiming objective truth to them, their answerability and their accountability would only increase. For an example of this, we, we look to Luke chapter 12. No need to turn there with me. But in Luke chapter 12, we have one of Christ's parables of the faithful and the unfaithful servant. Essentially, what happens is the master goes away he has two kinds of sermon. He has two kinds of servants: the the faithful one representing believers and the unfaithful one representing unbelievers. And the parable ends with a verse that should be haunting for all unbelievers. Verse forty-eight of Luke chapter twelve: "And from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required." Essentially, the more you know, but the more you reject, the greater your punishment will be in the eternity that is hell. This is the the beautiful mercy element of Jesus' parables. The less he told them that they would understand, the less their punishment would be. Yes, the primary reason for the parables is judgment. But secondarily, there is also this beautiful mercy element that we see. His parables are the same today. Judgment on unbelief, but also mercy on unbelief. For us believers, though, the parables illustrate truth because we can understand them. How do we understand them? Because they are explained to us. Even more than that, as one commentator writes, we can understand the parables because we have the whole of Scripture. We, have, we understand the whole gospel and we have salvation. 
Even when we don't have a recorded explanation, we can understand the parables, not because we've been given some mystical insight as believers, but because all the parables are about the gospel. That's true. All 40 parables are about the gospel. All 40 find their central truth in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The parables are about salvation. Because we've been granted salvation as believers, we can understand them. Let's say, what a blessing it is to have salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only have our, our sins been paid for in full by the poured out blood of Christ, but because of that, we can have understanding. The veil has been lifted from our eyes. Things that were previously unclear have now been made clear. What a beautiful thing that is for us as believers. The disciples might have walked with Jesus, but they still had to ask, what does this mean? Whereas now we have the complete canon of Scripture. We have the privilege of being able to read and hear God's Word. Jesus' ministry completely changed on this day. Once he taught sermons, but now because of the unbelief of the Pharisees and their intent to kill him, Jesus begins to speak in this collection of, of parables, showing judgment, but also mercy upon their unbelief. The parables are unique to Jesus in his teaching style. And for us today, it is important to understand them as for their intended purpose, which was to point towards salvation. Now we've seen what a parable is and the context that changed the teaching style of, of Jesus and how we must understand parables. Next, I uh, want to look at a couple of parables so as we can better understand how we are to interpret them. A couple of things at the outset that it is important to remember when we look at parables. As I mentioned earlier, parables are not just mystical stories with multiple meanings. There's not mystical meanings in every single detail of the parable, but rather a central gospel-focused, salvation-focused truth. There are often many applications that we can draw from the parables, but only one interpretation as was intended when Jesus spoke it. This morning I'd like to walk through two short parables. There are only, one's only one verse and the other is two. But yet they have such profound depth to them. Look with me at Matthew 13. We'll be reading verse 44 through to 46 together. Parable of the hidden treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Simple, right? You can see how an unbeliever reading this would be like, so, a guy found something valuable in a field and he bought it. Big deal. But as believers, our minds go to the most valuable thing that exists, our salvation and our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would give up everything to receive it, counting everything as loss. This is the central truth of these two parables. Two people gave up all. They forsook all to obtain something that is far of far greater value. Both parables center around a single individual who sacrifices all that he has in order to personally obtain that which is of a measurable value to him. This is the central gospel theme that we see, but also from these two parables we can learn several supporting truths about salvation. Firstly, we see that the kingdom of heaven or, or salvation, we're talking about the same thing, is priceless. Salvation is priceless. Both parables express the value of salvation through the idea that it is worth selling all one's possessions in order to receive it. The blessing of being a child of God through faith in Christ is completely and utterly priceless. 
Salvation is more valuable than all the possessions that the richest man could acquire. As 1 Peter 1, 4 tells us, salvation is an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. This pricelessness of salvation is forgiveness of sin, it is love, it is peace, it is happiness, it is virtue, it is purity, it is righteousness, it is eternal life, and so much more. For those whose hearts are genuinely turned to Christ, whatever values they have hung to in the past will be exchanged eagerly for the priceless treasure that is salvation. The beautiful thing is that the cost of this is the same for everyone. The rich, the poor, the knowledgeable, the unknowledgeable, it does not matter. The cost is everything that you have. Secondly, we see... The kingdom of heaven is is priceless, but we also see that it may be entered into from different circumstances. By this we mean that there are no preconditions to turning from sin and turning to faith in Christ. A person does not have to become anything else before he becomes a Christian. The two parables are the same in that the main character is a man who discovers something of extreme value and sacrifices everything he owns to buy it. But the way in which they come across their possessions or their treasures are vastly different. The first parable, the man comes upon the treasure completely by accident. As far as we are told, he's, he was not looking for anything and, and certainly not a priceless treasure. But in the second parable, however, the man was diligently looking for the very thing that he, that he eventually found. The first man is just going through life and either working in a field or perhaps just passing through on a journey, and finding a treasure was the last thing on his mind. In a similar way, many people can come across the gospel while pursuing the activities of their daily life. Busily occupied with earning a living or or caring for a family or or getting an education, they might hear a sermon or, or read a book or have a conversation that presents the gracious promise of Christ. By the Spirit's power, they recognize the priceless value of, of this message and they believe and they are saved and they inherit the kingdom of God. Second parable, on the other hand, depicts a man whose life business was searching for the thing that he eventually found. He represents the seeker after God who for years looks everywhere for the meaning and the purpose of life. This kind of person tries one religion or philosophy after another. And he finds nothing that that satisfies, but believes that the true way is ultimately out there somewhere. This man was looking for spiritual pearls, and by God's divine grace, found the one that was priceless beyond the greatest hope. Thirdly, we see that the kingdom of heaven, or salvation, is the source of true joy. It was from... Joy that the man sold all that he had in order to buy the field that had the priceless treasure. Joy is the basic desire in in every human being and it is the desire that all other desires directly or indirectly serve. The desire for food or or the desire for food brings us joy and satisfaction and and health to our bodies. The desire for money is primarily based on the joy we, we hope to find in the things that money can buy. Fame, power, and knowledge, and all other things we long for or desire for. Fame, knowledge, and power, and all other things we long for and desire for are the hope that they will hopefully bring one day. Yet all of those joys, they are temporary and they are disappointing. Only true and eternal joy is found in Christ and His kingdom because man was made by God for Himself. Human satisfaction can only be found in God's divine provision. The Apostle John declares this in the opening of his, his first letter, 1 John 1, four. He says, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. And Paul tells us that the kingdom of God is peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, verse 17. And the beautiful benediction of that letter that he prays for his readers. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. True joy comes only in the discovery and the taking hold of Christ and his kingdom through faith in him. 
Fourth and, and finally, the, the kingdom of heaven and salvation are made personal by a transaction. They're made personal by a transaction. In both parables here, the priceless object was bought at the expense of every possession the finder owned. And for that reason, some Christians feel uncomfortable about these parables because they seem to teach that salvation can be bought. But from beginning to the end of Scripture, it is abundantly clear that salvation is a total free gift of God. Yet, interpreted in the, in the right way, salvation is bought in the sense that the person who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior surrenders everything they have to Him. In all the parables, physical and earthly is used, to, is used to illustrate spiritual and heavenly. In these two parables, the economic transaction of buying represents the spiritual transaction of surrender. There is an exchange in salvation. The old is exchanged for the new. And in this parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, the transaction is clear. The sinner gives up all. All the worthless things that he has while freely receiving the priceless things God has to give him in Christ Jesus. When we talk about surrendering all or, or selling all or forsaking all that we have, this is so much more than just the surrender of, of physical things. This is a heart issue. What you're saying is in your heart, everything that I have, everything that I am and everything that I ever will be is nothing compared to my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it be a sporting achievement, a personal career, even your spouse or your family, everything fades in light of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. What we give up no, in no way pays for our salvation. To the contrary, what we give up is not only worthless, but it is worse than worthless. Even the righteous deeds of an unbeliever are filthy garments. Isaiah 64. Surrender of possessions, whether great or small, cannot buy salvation. Surrender is necessary not because it can buy anything, but because it is inevitable when salvation is truly sought. If you do not desire salvation above everything else, then you do not truly desire it. Salvation costs nothing in the sense of payment, but everything in the sense of surrender. Jesus said in, in Matthew 10, 37 to 39, He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves or his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. And on, on another occasion the Lord says, If anyone wishes to come to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To take up the cross is to forfeit everything, including physical life, if need be. Paul tells us, Philippians 3, whatever things were gained to me, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He testifies here that in coming to Christ, he willingly surrendered everything that he had. Like the men who bought the treasure in the field or the pearl of great price, they surrendered everything they had for the priceless treasure that they discovered. See how in this parable we have supporting truths and applications that are gospel-focused alongside the main central truth that is gospel-focused. No mystical insights. Two people gave up all, they forsook all to obtain something of far greater value. And in this truth we see that salvation is truly priceless. You see that salvation can be entered into by anyone from any circumstance. You see that salvation is the true source of joy and unending joy. And finally, we see that salvation is a personal transaction whereby we surrender all in order to follow Christ. I hope this morning that you know what it is to give up all in order to receive something that is far greater. Something that is of infinite value, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If this is unclear to you, 
please, please do not leave this building without having that explained. Please ask the question, what is it to have the kingdom of heaven? I hope that this has been a valuable insight into what the parables are all about. I look forward to continuing this series as we read and walk through several more of the parables of Christ in weeks and months to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, hearts humbled, thanking you for the God that you are. You are truly our great God. And you've provided for us your word, Lord, for, for those of us who have a personal relationship with you. Not only have you gone to the cross for us, bearing our sins, robing us in your righteousness, Lord, but you have lifted off the veil and given us eyes to see. And for this, Lord, we are eternally grateful. We thank you, Lord, that uh, in you we have eternal life. In you, to obtain that, Lord, we have to surrender all that we have. Help us to do that daily before you, Lord, as we walk before you. We pray these things and ask that you take us to our homes in safety now. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.